Thank you for being with us this morning. I uh, trust that uh, you've had a good morning so far and uh, you are ready to continue looking uh, uh, to worship just by uh, considering uh, some truth out of uh, God's Word. Hey, I'd like you to take your Bible and turn with, to, with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, and uh, actually want to find chapter 2. And while you're doing that, I just want to uh, remind you, hey, we've got the parking lot party tonight. We'd love for you to come. Uh, bring a mask, bring a lawn chair. We're going to be out here on the front, and we're going to try to do this as uh, safely as uh, we possibly can and uh, uh, help you to be as comfortable as you can, but also to be able to have some time just to connect with some folks. That has been... Uh, uh, a challenge and I know all of us have missed it so plan on coming six o'clock uh, till about 7 15 or as long as you want to stay but uh, uh, plan to come for that and uh, parents again just we'd love for you to be here Wednesday night just for an orientation thing for Awana uh, please leave the kids at home uh, at least for this night because there's just a ton of things that we want to brief you on to make sure you're cool with it and uh Understand exactly how we're going to be trying to do Awana so that we can do it safely and securely and uh, uh, all of that. And then finally, you know, the, the actually the most important announcement of all. On the front row, we have our guest of honor. Not our guest of honor, but our member of honor. Today is Vicki's mother, Alexandra's 91st birthday. So... <laughs> and guess what? She's, celebrate, she's celebrating by coming to church. She said six months is enough, and I'm going to wear my mask, but I'm coming. So uh, God bless. Uh, hey, um, you know, okay, the last five, six months, they've been different, weird, and, uh, you know, eventually things will get back to normal. But I want you to think about what the normal was before. You know, over the last six months, we're used to plans falling through. We're used to, oh, we're going to do this, and then at the last minute, something has to change, and it seems like pretty much everyone will cut each other slack, you know? I mean, oh, that came up, that came up, because, you know, it's almost like you can't plan anything. You can hardly even plan a lunch with someone, you know, without, you know, something maybe happening. But, you know, March and before, you know, it kind of irritated us when someone would change the plans, didn't it? Uh, someone would say, okay, let's do this. And you're like, okay, let's do this. Lunch, breakfast, go on a trip, meet at three to discuss this project or meet in the evening to finalize these details, whatever. And then... If you got a text or a phone call 15 minutes before, it's like, what's the deal? I mean, can you get your act together? And depending on how much we liked them, we'd cut them some slack. But you know, then when it happens, it's like, okay, I can't meet tonight. Uh, let's meet tomorrow night. And so you say, yeah, okay, cool. I understand things come up. And then when something came up the next night, it's like, will this person get their act together? You know, after a while, you just kind of get a little tired of it. Now, if you're the one making the changes, it's all understandable. I mean, when I text someone and say, hey, I know we planned on doing lunch, but, you know, something deep spiritual that came up and I've got to go minister, they always understand, or at least they always should. You know, if they're, if they're carnal, they don't, but you know what I'm talking about. Now, when I'm making the changes, when you're making the changes, it's perfectly understandable. But when someone else is making it, we get irritated. You know, we'll cut them a little bit of slack, or we'll chalk it up to their personality. But when that happens over and over and over, and particularly if we've kind of developed a little bit of a critical spirit about that person, you know what I'm talking about? After a while, instead of seeing them as a half-full individual, we see them as a half-empty individual it then goes, can go toxic really quickly. Now, I bring all that up because, in a way, that's kind of the attitudes that we're going to explore. That's a, that, those are the circumstances, and what I want us to do 
this morning for a little bit of time to, is to discuss and think about the attitudes associated with that kind of circumstance. Because here, here's what happened, okay? The Apostle Paul, uh, if you know your Bible at all, you know that he had a pretty strained relationship with the people that lived in Corinth. Corinth was a city in Greece, and Paul had gone there, led many people to Christ, helped them form into a church, and, uh, you know, things went well, but they kind of turned after a while, and for some reason, it just was always strained. And Paul actually wrote them four letters. We only have two of them, but Paul wrote them four letters, and the two we have are pretty strained. I mean, he, he's dealing with them on, you know, kind of ironing out real difficult situations. And, uh, you know, it was that kind of a situation. Well, well, here was the situation that was going on that I want us to think about. And, and I'm going to get a little technical, a little historical, but, but stay with it. I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible because I think that it's really important for you to understand this historical background. So Paul, as you know, was traveling around and he got to the point where he was in Ephesus and going to go to Corinth. Now, there on the map, you can see that's the Mediterranean Sea and that box that I've uh, highlighted there. We're going to zoom in on it a little closer. There's Ephesus there to your right, and there's Corinth to the, your left. And the plan was, Paul was in Ephesus, and things were going really well. He had been there for three months, and then, you know, uh, people still wanted to come and listen, and so he stayed even longer. And the plan was, when he was done in Ephesus, he was going to go to Corinth. He had informed the people in Corinth, and they were cool with it, and uh, that was plan A. But the longer Paul stayed in Ephesus and the more he heard information about what was going on in Corinth, it's like as he prayed about it, as he thought about it, you know, he had prayed and thought about plan A, but the more he prayed and thought about plan A, it's like God made it really clear to him that, no, hey, you know what, let's change the plan. And so plan B became Titus, is going, Paul was going to write a letter to the Corinthians, and this happens to be one of those letters we don't have. He'd already written him one letter. This was going to be a second letter, but like I said, we don't have that letter. But he wrote him a letter, and he sent it to the Corinthians via a guy named Titus. You know, the book of Titus is, a le is, about, is a letter that Paul wrote to this man Titus later on. So he wrote this letter to the Corinthians, sent it with Titus to Corinth, and he continued to stay on in Ephesus. That's plan B. And instead of following Titus to Corinth, Paul decided, hey, I'm going to go north up to a town called Troas because I've never had a chance to really spend a lot of time in Troas. And then... After Troas, then we're going to go over to Macedonia. That's an area that has churches in it like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And so it's like Paul said, I'm just going to make my way around the Aegean Sea. So Titus is going to go to Corinth with the letter, with the information I need those people to know. I'm going to stay and finish up here in Ephesus but when I'm done, I'll go to Troas. And by that time, Titus will have made his way around the Aegean Sea, and we're going to rendezvous in Troas. And then after we're done in Troas, then we're going to go up to Macedonia, and we're going to visit the people in Philippi, and we're going to visit the people in Thessalonica, and we're going to visit the people in Berea. Well, that was plan B. Well, guess what happened? Titus took the letter to the people in Corinth. Paul stayed in Ephesus as planned, but guess how long he stayed in Ephesus? He stayed there for two years. 
I mean, things started booming and growing, and everything was, I mean, you talk about staying for a while. He stayed for two more years in Ephesus. And, you know, of course, these are, you know, days before jets and quick travel and all that stuff. So, you know, it was going to be a long time before they rendezvoused in Troas. But, you know, this was really going to be a long time. Well, Paul finally gets up to Troas, and guess what? No Titus. Titus wasn't there. And so what does Paul do? He goes from Titus, or from Troas, up to Macedonia, up to where Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea is, and that's where he rendezvoused with Titus to hear how they had received this letter again a letter we don't have how the Corinthians received it now just think about it what's going on here the Corinthians okay I told you about them the Corinthians already were starting to think this Paul was kind of a flake I mean, wait a minute. You, you sent us this notice that you're going to finish up in Ephesus and come. And what did we get instead? We got some flunky named Titus who has this letter. And quite frankly, by the way, this letter wasn't all that becoming. This letter was a little ticked up, made us a little irritated. We didn't necessarily like the content of that letter. And so what did they start thinking about Paul they already saw him in a bad light they started being really critical of him when Titus got there and found out what they really thought he had to do a lot of talking to defend his boss and the apostle Paul knew all this stuff was going on the apostle Paul knew that when he was there in Ephesus and Titus had gone to Corinth, he knew that the people in Corinth just, I mean, he's assuming, but you know what? He assumed correctly. He assumed that they were thinking the worst about him. Why? This guy can't make up his mind. Is he coming or is he going? Is he sending someone else? Or is he going to come himself? And by the way, the guy's kind of a short, wimpy guy. He can't see very well. If he was living in the 20th century, he'd have had these big old thick glasses, but he doesn't even have those. And, you know, he's, when he talks, he's kind of meek and mild, and then he writes these, these vicious letters at us, and they were ticked off. And the Apostle Paul knew all of that stuff. Now, here's what I want you to do. How would you feel if you were the Apostle Paul? How would you feel if you were the Apostle Paul? Now, yeah, it's true. You played, prayed about plan A, and plan A made perfect sense two years ago. Then you prayed about plan B, and plan B made perfect sense. But I asked you to take your Bible and turn to... Uh, 2 Corinthians look at verse 12 2 Corinthians 12 Paul said now when I came to Troas remember the plan was he was going to leave Ephesus and go to Troas he doesn't know about plan C yet he doesn't know what God's real will is when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, there was a door wide open for me. But, verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit. Because Titus wasn't there. And so I took my leave and I went on to Macedonia. Now I'm asking, how would you feel if you were Paul how would you respond if you were Paul 
Well, let me tell you how I would respond. I wouldn't have liked it one bit. Quite frankly, I don't like looking like an idiot. I know I do it a lot, but I don't like looking like an idiot. Hey, wait a minute. Didn't you say you were going to Ephesus, then coming here? Why the change? What, why are you writing us a letter? You don't have the guts to come over here and preach the sermons yourself? I mean, anyone can write an email and tell somebody off. Can you just come and say it to my face? Or now, anyone can text someone, but you can't call me up on the phone. You can't meet with me in person and say it. I mean, I don't like looking bad. And in the Corinthians' eyes, Paul looked bad. And then Paul gets to Troas, and everything's going great. But there's no Titus there. And did you see it? Verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit. He, he was just so totally unsettled that Titus wasn't there. It's like, what went wrong? Is Titus still in Corinth? Or, I mean, is that place just falling apart and Titus is having to stay there? What's the deal? And, and finally, as he prayed and asked God, God's like, no, keep moving on. Go, you know, Titus isn't here, so go on to visit the people in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and all the other towns in Macedonia. And then Paul's thinking, man, when the Corinthians find out about this, they're going to really think ill of me. How would you feel? I mean, like I said at the beginning... I don't mind changing the plans on people until I realize, boy, this really makes me look stupid. And what really is bad is I'm sitting there and it's like I've got it all planned out. I've prayed and it's like, God, here's what we're going to do. And then I get really close to it and it's almost like God opens up the, my eyes a little wider and I'm just like, oh no. So then I change it and it's kind of like people are like, well, I thought we were doing this and it's like, yeah, but you know, the more I think about it, the more I pray about it, I think we should do this. And they're like, oh, okay. And then as we get closer to this, I say, oh, wait a minute. No, I think we're going to actually do this. Well, I thought you thought and prayed about that. Yeah, I did. But now I've thought and prayed about it some more and now we're doing this. But I thought you thought and prayed about it this. And all of a sudden, you just look like a flake. Now, am I the only one that can relate to this? This happens to me all the time. And, 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 and sometimes I get really irritated at God because I'm like, God, the Bible says you know the end from the beginning. And, I mean, if you knew this, why didn't you tell me six months ago, this is how Awana is supposed to work? If you know the end from the beginning, why didn't you tell me six months ago, this is how you're going to have to do Sunday morning children's ministry, or this is how you're going to have to do home groups, or this is how you're going to do community groups, or this is how you're going to do X, Y, or Z. Why does God sometimes shove us out there, and it's like we almost seem like we can't even see five feet in front of us? And... and in the back of our heads, we're, we're, we're certain we're doing what God wants us to do, but our spouse is saying, what gives? Can you just, just tell me what to do? Are we buying this or are we not buying this? Are we going there or are we not going there? Uh, well, I think we're going there, you know, and then it's like all of a sudden God's like, no, not, not really. And you're like, why didn't you tell me that last week? Why didn't I think those things last week? I've been praying about this. That happens. That happens. That's the circumstance that we're in. Now, I've told you how the Corinthians responded. I mean, they just got more and more critical of Paul. And that happens. There are carnal Christians, carnal believers that look at you and they see you following God and they get extra critical of you like the Corinthians did of the Apostle Paul. I told you how they feel. I told you how I feel. 
and I'm kind of hoping some of you relate to it. I hope I'm not the only baby Christian in the house here. You know, sometimes I feel really ticked, really irritated, almost angry at God that I've been put in this situation to look so foolish. But you know what? What I really want us to focus in on today is how the Apostle Paul felt. Because you know what? The Apostle Paul felt totally different than how I would feel. And he might feel, have felt totally different than how you generally would feel. Here's what's going on. Look at your Bible. Starting in verse 14 and continuing, and continuing all the way until chapter 7, we have a huge parenthesis or a huge footnote. You know, Paul's telling the story. Hey, I was in Ephesus, I went to Troas, then I went to Macedonia, and then in chapter 7 he finally says, oh, and that's where I finally caught up with Titus, and then he finishes the story. You know what he does from chapter 2, verse 14, all the way up to chapter 7, verse 4? It's this huge parenthesis, this huge footnote that is all about the joys and frustrations of following God, of actually walking with God and listening to Him. And it might be you're walking with God and listening to Him, and you've been heading at that thing for the last 10 years, and you get closer and closer and closer, and it's like all of a sudden God says, nope, take a right. And then you take that right, and then all of a sudden God says, nope, take a left. And you're like on your way back, and then God says, take another left. And you go, is it? yeah, that is left. And uh, I don't know my left from my right a lot of times. And, and you go this way, and then you go this way, and then you go this way, and it's like, God, I always thought I was supposed to be going at that thing. And God's like, yeah. We'll get there. It's kind of like God said to Joseph. Joseph, you're going to be the head of the family. You got, 12, you got 13, uh, 11 brothers, but you're going to be the head of the family. And he ends up a slave in Egypt. He rises up through the ranks, becomes the head slave of this cool house. Okay, it's starting to happen. Ends up in jail. Stays in jail. Meets some high officials in jail the butler the baker man those are my tickets i'm going to be the original networker you know it's just a matter of time he connects with them smoozes with them they forget him one of them even dies i thought i was heading there you've got me taking a left and a right and another left and then a u-turn all about the joys and frustrations of following God. Of actually getting involved and saying, you know what, God? I am here to do your will. I may be a salesman, but I'm a Christian salesman. I am a salesman for God's glory. I may be a lawyer, but I am a Christian lawyer. I am a lawyer for God's glory. I may be a school teacher, but I'm a I'm a Christian school teacher. I am a school teacher that is here for God's glory. I, you know, that is my calling. That is my, my thing. And, and, and God, I want you to run the show. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, graduate from this. Go for that. Try to get this promotion. Try to get this thing. But you know what, God? You are driving the ship. You're steering the car. And the Apostle Paul, for the next four chapters, talks about the joys and frustrations of following God. Because you know the way we look at it? In our mind, God should be a God of efficiency. And the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And quite frankly, God never, never goes in a straight line. Why? Because he's got something bigger. 
He's got something more profound. He's got something that we'll probably never fully understand until we get to heaven. Now, quite frankly, this has got to be like the world's longest introduction to a sermon. But I'm trying to make the point because I'm not just introducing a sermon. I'm introducing the whole series. What we're going to do for the next eight weeks, we're going to take the time to basically look at this long parentheses, this long footnote where the Apostle Paul says, I know what was going on in the Corinthians' eyes. They were just highly critical of me. Wrong, but highly critical of me. And I'll deal with that later. And I know what you would have thought. You'd have been irritated, bitter. Nobody likes to feel like an idiot. Nobody likes to look like a flake. Nobody likes to look like a fool. Nobody likes to look wishy-washy. Let me just tell you what I felt let me just tell you what I felt that God gave to me. That's what we're going to look at for the next eight weeks. And it starts in chapter 2, verse 14, and it goes till chapter 7, verse 3. So today, just for the last couple minutes that I've got before we take communion together, I want you to look at verses 14 down to verse 17. Look at what Paul says. He just kind of breaks off. Again, this is this, if you didn't understand all that context that I just went through, you'd read through this and it's like it wouldn't make much sense. But when you understand that, that, that Paul's basically, time out. You think I felt like a flake? You think I looked like an idiot? You think that all of a sudden I was demoralized because all of a sudden I looked foolish? Not at all, Paul says. Look at verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. Rather than feeling like a dummy, rather than feeling like a flake, Paul said, thank you, God. Thank you. I mean, and, and go back up and look at verse 12. I didn't even really bring this out about Troas. I mean, in Troas, the numbers were there. He was getting converts. Things were happening. It was a success. He planted a church, and it's booming. And you're saying, you're still going to the mission field? What are you, you're walking away from a promotion. You're walking away from big money. You're leaving big money on the table, Paul. And Paul said, I don't care. God's leading me to go on to Macedonia. He's got my spirit so stirred up, I can't stay here. And he walked away from an open door. It wasn't a mistake. It didn't make sense, humanly speaking. We're always into bigger is better. More is better. But Paul said, I don't care what the statistics say. I'm going where God leads me. Thanks be to God who always, if you underline things in your Bible, you ought to write, underline the word always. And let me show you another word you ought to make note of. See that word triumph? It's kind of unfortunate. It doesn't come through in hardly any of our English triumph, uh, in any of our English translations. What Paul, the word Paul used there, about the best parallel to today is New York ticker tape parade. Now, I know we don't hardly ever do those anymore. They may do them up there, you know, for a basketball team or a football team, but they'd never do it for, you know, the president. Well, they'd never do it for the president, but, uh, but they might do it for the next president. Who knows? But, but, you know, just security, they don't hardly do those things anymore. But, you know, after World War II and after great victories, I mean, huge parades. Well, they would do those in Rome. And they weren't an every other month thing. They weren't even an every year thing. It, it might be a decade in between these things. But there were these things called Roman triumphants. And, and these were like these huge, huge parades that would have been planned for, for months. And they were to honor a general 
who had come back from a glorious victory where Rome's empire had been expanded and where the enemy had been just decimated and uh, the soldiers under his, his guard had, uh, had really done well. And so they'd put together these huge parades and, and the Senate, the Roman Senate, would kind of lead them so you'd have all the senators walking through the crowds and then, and then it'd follow by artifacts of uh, the conquered place. When Titus, not this Titus, but another Titus, conquered Jerusalem and they had a Roman triumvirate for him to honor his great accomplishment of conquering Jerusalem. They carried through the table of showbread. They carried through the, the big candlestick that he had stolen out of the temple and all these things. I mean, that's what they would do. And then they, 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 they'd have some token POWs from the thing, some people that didn't die in battle, but they were soon to die. We're going to get them over there and let some lions eat them. And they'd have them go. And then finally, towards the very end, the Roman general... You know, at the end of a parade, it's always the, bat, the last one is the big guy. So there's the Roman general, and then behind him are his soldiers who actually made it happen. That's the imagery that Paul has here. And he says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. So it's like Jesus Christ is the Roman general and we, the Apostle Paul, and us, we're the soldiers walking behind. And Paul says, you might look at me and say, I'm defeated. You may look at me and say, boy, that was kind of idiotic. You may look at me and say, boy, this guy cannot make a plan and stick with it his yes is no and his no is yes and Paul says uh uh it's not that way at all thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of God in every place you know as part of that triumphant one of the things they'd do is they'd have the Roman priests going along with censers that were burning. And so the parade route just, just smelled with this, this beautiful fragrance of victory. And Paul says, that's what I am. And when you're following God, that's what you are. Look at verse 15. For we are a fragrance. So it's like he changes the analogy. Initially, we're the soldiers behind the general. Now we're, the, we're also the priest. We're actually the fragrance that the priests are spreading. We're the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. I mean, you are a smell good of God. That's what you are. That's what Paul was. When you're following God, when you're on that day-to-day moment by moment relationship with God where you're, you're, you're heading in the direction you think God wants but then when God says take a right you take a right when God says take a left you take a left when God says turn around you turn around when you're doing that even though the world looks at you and says flake, idiot, can't make up his mind wishy-washy Paul says not at all you got a problem with it talk with my general you'll meet him someday Hope you're on his side, by the way. He says, quite the contrary. I'm following the general in victory. And quite, quite the contrary. I'm actually that smell good that is going through the streets of Rome. And you know, those who are being saved, we smell great. When a believer sees another believer walking with God, taking a left, taking a right, turning around, sit down, stand up, fight, fight, fight. You know, when he just sees that, you sit there and you say, I hope I can follow God like that. 
That's a sweet smell and savor. Now, if you're carnal, fleshly, sinful like the Corinthians, you say flake. But to a believer, to a person who's really in tune with God, and you see that person, you scratch your head and say, God, what are you doing? But boy, I sure hope that when you do that in my life, I can follow like that. That's what he's saying there. For we're a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death, and the other, an aroma of life to life. The believer looks at it and says, I want that life. You know, Jesus talked about the abundant life. Jesus talked about the vibrant life, the interactive life that is kind of energizing and fun because it's like almost every day you see the movement of God in your life. That's thrilling. That's energizing. That's what wakes you up in the morning. The carnal, the fleshly, the unbeliever, they look at it and say, Boy, that guy just keeps shooting himself in the foot. That guy does not know how to get a church going. That guy does not know how to get a business going. That guy does not know how to educate kids. That guy does not know how to build this or build that. They see it as just death to death to death to death to death. It doesn't make sense to them. Now, here's, a, here's one of the takeaways. Folks, sometimes when you are really vibrantly following Christ... And you're taking that right and then that left and turning around and all this stuff. Sure, other godly believers are going to say, I want that. Unbelievers and carnal believers like the Corinthians, they're going to say, you're nuts. And, and you have to sit and know this passage really well because there's way too many people who are out there and we start listening to the wrong spectators. The spectators along the parade route, the believers are saying, go, I can't wait till it's my turn to be in the parade following my general. And the critics are out there thinking you're nuts. And when you start wanting their praise, it's just a matter of time before you step out of the parade. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. And look at the end of verse 16. We'll actually talk about this next week. Man, this is a hard situation. Now, who's adequate for these things? The answer is no one, but still come in next week and hear what the real explanation is. But that's the sermon. For we are not like many who are just selling the word of God. But as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ and in the sight of God. Man, I'm all in. I'm doing this God's way. God says right, left, forward, backward. I'm doing it. That's what Paul said. The world might look at you and say foolish, and Paul says, uh-uh, I'm following my general. I am a sweet fragrance of the incredible victory that Christ purchased. You know what this passage has basically been saying? And I'm going to use a word here that is uh, kind of in vogue these days. When we're following Christ because of the victory he won, we're essential. We're, we are vital to his cause you might feel like you've been in Troas and you walked away from success but boy if God told you to walk away you are essential you're doing exactly what God wants you to do I mean you might be sitting and saying I'm not doing much all I'm doing is and God says you're doing exactly what I called you to do I called you to stand there in that corner. I'll let you know when it's time to move. I'll let you know when it's time to turn around. You're essential. Paul's saying, when I'm following Christ, when you're following Christ, 
forget about what the world thinks forget about what carnal christians think you are essential you are essential you're the fragrance of christ you're the smell good of christ now quite frankly when you look at this and what this truth is that paul was bringing out just in these couple verses there's a there's a really important question did you see that that first line that i wrote there when you're following christ you know that's tough and i think every one of us need to ask ourselves am i following christ or have i already left the parade route and i'm doing something different just because you're part of the family doesn't mean you're always going in the direction that the family's called to go. You know, I find that this, this question, and, and I'm just going to briefly answer it here in a minute, but these chapters that we're going to be considering, it tells us an awful lot about the answer to this question. The question is basically this, you know, how do I know I'm doing God's will. How did Paul know he was supposed to stay in Ephesus for another two years? How did Titus know that he was supposed to stay in Corinth evidently longer than he and Paul had originally planned? How did Paul know that he went to Troas and with Titus not there, he was going to go to Macedonia? and their meetup with Titus. How do you know? Job A or job B? Person A or person B? How do you know? Yeah, I'll, they asked me to work in Awana, I'll work in Awana. Well, that answer is always yes, that, okay? How do, how do you, but how do you know? I mean, okay, do we buy this house? Do we not buy this house? Do we take this job or do we not take this job? Do I, do I let my kids get involved in this thing or do I let my kids get involved in this other thing or do I just say no to everything? I mean, if the more you think about it, it is hard to discern the will of God. But actually, you know what? This is going to sound really simplistic, but it's not. It's not simplistic, but it is simple. And like I said, we'll talk about this a lot more as over the couple, next couple weeks. But you know what I have found? Discerning God's will basically boils down to three things, three filters. God's word, God's people, and God's peace. I mean, honestly, what is God saying about, in his word, about your specific situation? What is he saying about your attitude in this specific situation? Because you can sit and say, well, God doesn't say whether I go with Adobe or IBM or Amazon or someone else. God doesn't say Arkansas, Texas, A&M, Texarkana College. God doesn't give those specifics, but, you know, he does say a lot in his word about our attitudes and our motives and our whatever. Some things that we ask that question about, they are just black and white, but we like to stay intentionally agnostic. Maybe when it comes to our marriage. Maybe when it comes to a potential marriage. Maybe when it comes to divorce. Maybe when it comes to, you know, some kind of a financial deal. Scripture is actually pretty clear on a lot of those things. But a lot of times we just intentionally like to stay stupid thinking we'll get by. Uh-uh. I mean, when you have a decision, you need to go to the Word of God and say, what does it say about this thing? What does it say about my attitudes, my motivations? The first one is God's Word. Second one is God's people. And I'm not just talking about anyone that's saved. I'm talking about godly people. I'm sure that if Paul went and talked to the Corinthians, who were Christians, but totally carnal, they would have said, you get your hiney over here to Corinth and take care of our needs. I don't care what's going on in Ephesus. 
You don't go to ungodly people for advice. You go to ungodly people if you want them to affirm you in your sin, and that's, quite frankly, what we do a lot of times. A lot of times we get very affirmed in our sin by going and talking to other people who are still steeped in their sin, and we can, we can find a whole community of Christians who will affirm us in our sinful decisions. Let me tell you, the best thing you can possibly do after you've gone to the Word of God is to go to some very godly people who love you enough to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. I don't know how many times Vicki and I have reached out to older godly people who have spoken the truth in our life, told us we're arrogant, told us we were proud, told us we were selfish, told us we needed to get our priorities right. And then sometimes they said, charge, go after it. Go to Troas, walk away from that great thing in Troas and get yourself to Macedonia. But that came from godly people. Do you have some godly people in your life that you've given permission to to speak truth into your life? One of the smartest things you can do, one of the wisest things you can do is to give the godly people in your life, particularly the older godly people in your life, a green light to speak into your life. And you're really smart when you ask them. Because godly people don't like to butt their nose into people's business. But you know what I'm saying. And then quite frankly... The last one, uh, godly peace, sanctified godly peace. When you are really in tune with God, what are the desires of your heart? What is it that God really has given you a burden to do? I think that that's what Paul was thinking. Paul was right there with him in, in Troas, but there was no peace. He might have been preaching and people were coming to know the Lord and all that, but, but there were bigger things and, and he was thinking about it and feeling it. And, and it's like, I'm sorry, guys. I gotta go. There, there's, you know, he probably didn't go into detail. There's this mess in Corinth and I got a guy coming from there and we gotta deal with that thing. And he did. That godly peace. Here's the deal. When you're walking with God, I mean, God is leading you in triumph. You can, you, can, you can discount what the world says, what carnal believers say, but it's imperative that you're walking with God. You can't just say, God, rubber stamp my foolishness. It's like, no, God, I want to make sure. If this is the job I want, it, you want for me, I want it. I don't care how much money they're paying me. I don't care how lucrative it is. If that's not the job, I'm walking away. I don't care how this good this school is. If that's not the school for me, I'm walking away. Because I'm looking to you to lead me. 